fella, maybe. Somebody's going to have to help James because he's, uh, he's got the kids. Fred, you want to take it up and then just bring it back up here and we'll take care of it. Okay. Um, well, we're going to do that. We're going to take a couple minutes here. and I know we're not many, but I know we've got many memories. And since it's Father's Day, we're going to take a couple minutes and testify about our fathers, if you want to. Um, so, who wants to jump off here? Who wants to start it out? I, you know what? I will. Because I'll tell you a little bit about my dad. And, uh, you know, I, I really can't remember my dad being one that would tell me that he loved me. I, you know, growing up, I'm not sure I ever remember that. Now, not be just because I have a bad memory. Uh, yeah, James is back there. But uh, my dad always showed me that he loved me. You know, he... He was a hard. He worked hard. Worked a lot of years at Goodrich, but you know when he came home, it was all about family and taking care of his boys and and his wife and everything. So my dad was a disciplinary also, and uh, you know if we had a spanking coming, it wasn't a promise. It was a sure thing. You was going to get corrected. That was another way he showed me he loved me, and he really loved me at times in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember one conversation before my dad passed away. We was sitting around the boys were and we was talking about getting spankings. And I mean, my dad didn't spare the rod, but I mean, he used the belt. I, you know, a lot of people use the switches and stuff like that, but I, my dad used the belt. And we was talking and carrying on. He said, man, you guys make it sound like I beat you. I said, you did. You did beat us. But I said, we probably deserved it. I said, they'd put you in jail nowadays for those kind of things. But I also know that I had a dad that, you know, knew if I wasn't corrected that I'd have trouble on down farther in my life. He loved me enough to discipline me, just like our Heavenly Father does. So, anybody else? Because I know everybody had a dad somewhere along the line. You may not have known him early in life. You may not have known him late in life. But everybody has a dad, just like they have a mom. So, anybody want to testify about their dad? No chicken poop, poop stories? Anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got, I got a question to ask. Tony, what's it feel like for the first Father's Day to be a father? Oh, pretty special. I woke up this morning and it was just, I knew it was Father's Day, you know. We've had pets before, but this one was kind of special. <laughs> I got a card from her and Amber put some pictures on it of her and she ordered it offline. It was, made me tear up. It was really special. Um, different. Amen. It was a great memory, definitely. Amen. I, I know a lot of young people, when I testify to them, you know what, you don't always have to testify about the Lord, but I say, you know, the, the fruit of a good marriage is kids. And even though a marriage is a blessing, kids are a blessing above that. And you'll never, you know, you'll never be able to let people understand that till they're up at 2.30 with that blessing. <laughs> <laughs> How about anybody else? No, we can't be quiet tonight. All right, Annie. Well, my dad, you know, growing up, I, I'm so thankful that God didn't always live that way, but I grew up in a Christian home, and, and he was a preacher for probably 45 years. And I know until I was at least 15, I was at church every, every Sunday, you know, and uh, I said, well, just in the revivals they would have different preachers but I can remember you know sitting in church and I just sat and I'd wait and wait and I would think when's dad going to come to preach I'm looking forward to seeing dad and I, would, I remember those times with him and then working in the field tobacco fields and, and stuff me and him you know there was a lot of kids but me and him was two that we stuck together till the end where he passed on and uh, you know we had just I was always a daddy boy, and we had a lot of stuff to find us together. I mean, I truly miss him, but, you know, I, I did promise him, and, and you know, I, uh, with the Lord saving me and, and, and on the road I'm on, I'm going to keep that promise. You know, I promised him before he died in the hospital uh, that, Dad, you haven't seen the last of me. I will see you again in heaven. That's, that's awesome to have a godly heritage. You know, I, I, I'm like you. 
growing up, I don't remember missing church. We didn't miss church. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, sometimes we, you know, we didn't get satisfied at church. But even when you was out running around being an ornery dude, Sunday morning, I don't care what time you got in, you was going to church. I mean, that was, you know, well, you lived in their house. That was the command, and that's what you did. You know, and, you, and, you know, nowadays, now we're elder and we're older, we thank them for that, don't we? And, and, and he done me like your dad did you. You know, he would love me with a switch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I would love to have my dad in the yard, and I'd wait till dark, and he'd be on the porch, and he'd, he'd keep, you know, talking with me, and he'd say, the longer you're awake, the longer you're awake. <laughs> It's great to have memories like like oh, yeah. that, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, and I know my dad's in heaven. You know, I, he wasn't the most perfect guy, but he loved the Lord. You know, as my mom did, and and uh, you know, God takes us just like that. He he perfects them when they get to heaven, but you know, as long as they have salvation, you know, we're going to be sitting down at that marriage supper together. Amen. Anybody else? I just gotta say, my dad gets smarter, the older I get. <laughs> I think you got a pretty good dad too. <laughs> I know he had his hands full. <laughs> How about anybody else? I just remember my dad wanted me to do the best I could be. And I have a memory of him. And my mom used to always tell me, that, yeah, never say you can, but I remember the first time I said I couldn't do something. You know, me had one hand, and he said, you what? And I, I just remember him getting mad, you know. He said, you can do whatever you want to do and get whoever you want to be. And I, you know, today that still sticks with me. That's right. You know, and his words, I can't do for my mom. And, you know, mostly my dad, when he would push me every day, you know, it seemed like he worked every day, but came home, it seems like he had time for me, whether it be sports, or whether it be you know, reading, whether it be video games, he always had time for me, so that's a good memory to have. Isn't that amazing that how you can draw a parallel with your dad and with the Lord, Tony? Yeah. He always has time for us. He always wants to sit down with us. He always wants to do for us. He always wants to expect the best for us. Tell us there's things we, we can or can't do. I mean, he's never telling we can't, can't do it. You, what about you, Mackenzie? What about your dad? That's a good girl. That's a good girl. That ought to make her dad tear up a little bit. Amen? All right. I, I'm going to give one more chance. If anybody wants to make a comment or move on. or I said dads give us special memories, don't they? I said teach us to fish. They teach us to to become young men and they... They, like I said, discipline us because they love us. You know, you never realize how hard that is until you're a father or mother and you have to discipline. That's When they always said, it's hard, this is as hard for me as it is for you. It's going to hurt me more, it's going to hurt you. I think that's the way it is, right? You realize that then, you know. Well, we can talk about that now. we got gray hair or what hair we got and the older we get. And you, you guys will realize it soon, you know. Uh, it, it just, uh, discipline is a form of love and... <laughs> and he'd always say, "Don't spare the rod." Yeah. <laughs> I remember, I had a good dad, and uh, he never sweat me much, but <laughs> but you see the love there, you know. And I was thinking uh, not long ago that. I was level, but this one Sunday I'll never forget it. Uh, Dad and Mom sat on the front porch and they was practicing a song, I'll Fly Away, because there's no singing that night at church. And you know them is precious memories. Yeah. Precious memories. And I like to go with him when he went to town. And 
I had to be pretty little because I always said, mm, Dad, I smell ice cream. <laughs> 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 I always got an ice cream cup. <laughs> but um, it's good to have precious memories of Iron folks. This is. It really is. One day, we'll stand That's right. Yeah. I can remember just like you were talking about that. Dad would always treat us there once in a while. He'd bring home a bun bar, you know, those little bun bars. We thought that was something. I mean, that's the way he showed his love. I mean, he, he was always thinking of something that would bless you, you know. I mean, they're, they're always, you know, a good father is always putting his kids and his family first. Amen. I remember sitting on the seat up front, and he had his arm around me, you know, and he kept flipping my hair behind my ear, and that just irritated me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just little things like that that is really precious to you. We never had a doctor. Mom and Dad always prayed for us. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you got more wisdom, right, Fred? Because he drove it into you. I know Lori would always talk about that uh, when it comes to spankings, she didn't get very many because Mike took them all for the girls. He did. I don't know what kind of wisdom that was, but the girls appreciated it back then. <laughs> All right, John, I've been waiting for you. But I always knew my parents loved me, my father and my mother both. But I had a very good friend who uh, was treated very badly by his father. And I just can't forget that we were in high school. I saw him slide into third base or some one of the bases, I don't know. And I know he was trying to please his dad. His dad was a mean son of a gun and accepted, wouldn't accept errors at all for the son. And his son was subject to errors like everybody was. He slid into the plate, broke his ankle, stood up and fell down. His dad was the coach. His dad ran over and kicked him. And that's the that's the way I knew his dad to treat him all the time. Mm -hmm. We graduated from high school in, in 1961. In 1966, I come home from the service, and uh, his name was Jim Jim, and uh, James we call him James, and uh, he wasn't with us anymore. From the time I'd left home to go into the Air Force, sometime in there between that time and the time I came home, he'd been sent to Vietnam and he lasted about 60 days and died. And every time I think about fathers and father's days, I can't help but pray for him and hope that he found a father's love before yeah. he left this, land, this earth because he didn't have it down here. You know, we, we do take our fathers for granted, too, because as our kids grew up, you know, um, we always liked the fact that kids would come to our house because that way you keep an eye on your kid, you know. But also, you'd also see the, the boys that would come that, like John said, maybe not had a, a good father or not a father at all and just looking for somebody to give them attention or even sometimes to tell them that they were wrong. And, and that's part of the demise of this country right now is the family unit being broken down without any fathers. Fathers walking away from their responsibilities, even mothers in, nowadays. And uh, that's, that's part of the reason we're in the state we're in now. Any more? I'm not going to shut anybody out. One we can smile or laugh or cry about. We're going to move on. So, it's, uh, I've got a little bit of a word. I don't have a long word. But it's kind of it's kind of uh, interesting that you sang a song about a river. You know, I I told uh, Enoch I said, 
you know, all along I've been, you know, the searching for a message. You know, the Lord's been speaking into me a message. And, and you know, at the barn, we have to listen to, we get two stations. We either get 99.7, hot, 90, hot 99.7, whatever it's called. And we get, we can barely, barely get in WBCL. So we listen to WBCL a lot. And I will say a lot of the music, the, what is it, the, what's, what's it called when the music, it's not the lyrics, it's the, when the, the, the sound part of it or the music part of it, it, the melody. Sometimes it's a little tough for Jeff to handle, but I like to listen to the, some of the words, and some of the words are, they, they really have a, um, they minister to you. Just like uh, Della said this morning about Enoch and his singing, you know, the, 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 the words speak a message into your heart, and and one of the songs that I, would, I that I want to talk about tonight, it's uh, part of the, the words say, "Come to the river and lay yourself down." And it says, "Come to the river and let your heart be found." Now, that that in a nutshell should be our Christian walk. So we've all come to the Lord and we've all laid ourselves down, but we need to continue, just like the song that Enoch sang. We need to continue to let ourselves be immersed in that water, be immersed in that anointing, in that presence of the Lord, to know that, that he, he wants to do a continued work in us. It just isn't about salvation. It's about from salvation to eternity. And so many people get it wrong to the fact that they think salvation is the end. I've made it to heaven. It's just the start. You know, time and time again, I've heard him say about the Bible, you know, it speaks a little bit about getting saved, but then the rest of the, the book or the, or the Bible, is about staying saved, about progressing in the Lord. And a few weeks ago, the pastor was preaching, and, and he talked about clay. Can you, everybody remember that? He was talking about clay. And if you know anything about clay, of course, we're in, a, we're in an area where, you know, they had the old clay mills and everything like that. So, you know, Haven had one. Uh, Boffman's had one. But when you go to work with clay, you've got to use a lot of water. So, and just like that in our spiritual walk, we're a, hump, we're a lump of clay, amen? And there we are, the Lord's preparing us, and He's working us, and He's a spinning us and everything. And He just keeps adding that water and adding that water, His presence, to do something in our lives. Well, sooner or later, after He gets us formed, you know, if you don't do anything with clay, what's it going to do? It's going to dry. But what's it going to do when it's dry? It's just going to crack, right? What did they used to do in the old days back here when they made the tile? What did they do with that clay? No, they stuck it in the fire. In order for it to, to have water go through it, it was stuck in the fire. And I can remember when, when the pastor preached on that, I said, man, that's a good word. I, I, I like to stand up and tell him, say, hey, that clay had to be stuck in the fire. Remember, he used to say, you know, the, the guy said he hit it and went ting or ting. Well, you know, that's where we are in our spiritual walk right now. For a lot of us, the Lord's got us formed. And he's taught. To, he's, he's taught us His Word. He, he's given us the, 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 the water, the Word, His presence. And he, he stuck us in the fire. Man, I hate to tell you, but I hate this fire. Because it seems like every week I'm back on that belt that's going back through that thing, and it's, He's turning it up again. But I know He's preparing me to be used for that water to go through me, to be a witness you know, in these end times. You know, I see in the church world today, so many people that served the Lord for so long walking away. And we're so close to the finish line. And their walk has been consumed about themselves. It's never, no more anymore is it about servanthood. No more is it anymore about what can I do for somebody that needs a help. You know, we, we've got a Christianity that I believe in America. Uh, Dale was talking about he believes we're the church of Laodicea church. What to say? You're, you're poor. You say you're rich. You're in need of nothing. That's the way our church is in America right now. I believe that people sit in church and, and it comes offering time and you know they get out their money and they stick in their offering and they think they've done their deed to the Lord. Right? They think that offering's enough. Come on. It's His. It's His. The only thing they're getting satisfied with, they're satisfying their spiritual conscience. You know, that, that's, you're giving back to the Lord so the Lord can bless you. You're not doing that to satisfy your spiritual... We have become a church that is idle. 
That is, you know what, uh, I'll just tell you. Go to 1 Thessalonians, I think it's uh, chapter 5. But Paul's talking about end times here. And, he, you know, we've read, we've read this numerous times in, in this church. And uh, um, he, he can recognize what's going to happen in end times. And, and you got to remember, he's talking to the church here. He's not talking to, to the outside world. And when you get into uh, verse number 12, it says, Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the high regard and love because they're their work. Now, here he's talking about the pastor. He's telling you to hold the pastor up, love him, hold him in high regard. You know, we, we've talked about that before. You've you got to be in prayer for him. You have to be, uh, who was the two fellows that held up Moses' hand? Aaron and Hugh, or who was it? Somebody like that, you know, during the battle. That's what we've got to do as a congregation. We've got to hold the pastor's hands up. You know, um, you know, if we don't pray for him, you know, there's no power. There's no power. You know, I've heard it say time and time and time again. It, it amazes me when people walk away, start walking away from the Lord, who's the first person they blame? The preacher. Now, they may have heard that sermon. They may have him preached for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. But all of a sudden, the word's boring. All of a sudden, the word's too long. It's the pastor's fault. Sure. Where have you been all week? Where have you been all week? Have you been with the Lord? Have you fellowshiped with the Lord? I'm telling you, you're not getting nothing if you planted nothing. The preacher just preached on that last week, amen? If you're not willing to plant, if you're not willing to toil in the soil, you're not going to receive a harvest. Amen? So it just amazes me in these end times as I see people around me. And they walk away. I'm not saying they're walking away from the Lord, but they walk away from fellowship. But yet it's everybody else's fault. I, I'm, just, I'm, amazed to, I'm amazed to that. And, and you know what? The very next verse, Paul tells us in Thessalonians, he says, And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle. Warn those who are idle. Encourage the timid. Help the weak. And be patient with everyone. Now, I always like this because you hear, you hear this in, in, in church services all around. Ah, that's works. That's works. Really, is it works? The, the, you suppose the Lord thinks it's works? Do you think Paul says it was works? You know, with the shadow of the cross coming right before him, what did the Lord do? What did the Lord do? He washed the disciples' feet. Servanthood. Wanting to give to those that need help. Wanting to those that need a word of encouragement so that they can finish their race. Amen? Amen. We're going to finish this up because, you know, it, it kind of is what we're, we're, I'm going to talk about. It says, And we urge your brothers to warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. Man. Come on. Now I want to tell you something. And I'm not saying this because when you're a mature Christian, you're going to find out giving thanks in all situations is tough to do sometimes. Because if that Lord's going to make you that piece of clay, that fire, that baby's hot sometimes. And I'll tell you what, he's trying to burn out some crap out of you so that you'll quit whining, you'll quit complaining, and you'll thank him. Boy, I tell you, it's hard. Has anybody else got that problem? I'm telling you, I, him and I have this conversation numerous times. Lord, please, we want an easy day today. Anybody, everybody ever pray that? We want a good day today. We want to be encouraged. Not always just being encouragers. We want your presence just to overwhelm us, and we don't want bad to happen. Amen? <laughs> it says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out 
the Spirit's fire. And I'll tell you, that's where I see our church world today. See, I see a church that has a form of godliness, but lacks the power. Why? No Spirit. No Spirit. It's all become about man. His charisma, his elegance of speech, his book that he can write, he wants you to send him money for so that... You know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't get on that bandwagon because I know there's a lot of good ones out there that are doing good with their money, doing good with the ministry that the Lord has, has you know, kept them with. But there's bad ones too. You know, and later on, it, it, it's going to tell you to test them. To test them so that you know who to give to, who to pray for, you know, and, and, and who to keep. But I see a church that lacks the power. Just like I thought Dell was right on target today. I really believe the greatest harvest is in the United States. I really don't. We've, we, we've, we've, we've satisfied our spiritual beings. You know, I'm not saying that we do it in this church because I know we won't. We accept homosexuality. We accept coming to church whenever it's convenient. We accept being, like it says out on the sign, part-time Christians when, when the Lord's called us to a full-time ministry. Even if it's not in the pulpit, you know people read your life, and as the pastor said, maybe the only Bible they read. And if you're not full time, we'll never draw them. We'll never get them. But you know, overseas, their, their salvation is coming to cost, and they know they're they're sealed. They're sealed for that day. But their names written in the Lamb's book of life. It means something to them. But here, it just. It just don't seem like it, it has no meaning to most people that go to church. Church is a get up on Sunday morning, get around, go to church, satisfy my spiritual conscience, yeah. and then I'm good for the rest of the week. No more reading, no more fellowship, no, no more uh, wanting to encourage somebody that's going through a tough time. No more, you know, we, we've become self-absorbed. But you know, I think there's a time coming when the Lord's saying, enough is enough. I think He's separating the, sh- the sheep and the goat. Just like Dell said this morning. You know, he, he was out there talking earlier. And I tell you, he, he stumbled a little bit like I do up here. But back there, I, Diana would tell you, and Lord would tell you, man, you just can't get him shut off. <laughs> I mean, once he starts, it's boom, 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 boom. And I really do believe that his expertise is in... Israel and Islam and Hebrewic, you know, because that's what I heard a lot out of him. And, and, and I think he's coming back to, to present that to us sometime maybe in August or a little bit later. But uh, I lost my train of thought where I was going with that. But he's right when he talks about the, the sheep and the goat. But you know, later on in that chapter, when he's talking talk about separating the sheep and the goat, the people even ask, hey, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not? He says... I don't, I don't know you. And, and why does he say that? Because God knows our hearts. He knows that the things that we've done for him, whether they're genuine or they're not. He knows whether you've given of yourself to other people. He knows if you furthered his kingdom or not. We, you know, we can't fool him. Or Reverend Miller, I, he, he's still alive. And he does, I mean, he's ancient. But he always... I always liked his preaching because he'd always say, well, I'll give you an example. Seth was probably in high school. He, he was. He was a junior, and I think Chris was a senior. And they played in the, the regionals up to uh, Toledo. And, man, it rained that night. I mean, it rained and rained and rained. And, and Paul Miller come to preach the next day down at the Mass Church. He says, you know, I went to the ball game last night. He says, I'll just tell you the truth. If it was raining like that in his church, I wouldn't have went to church. But I was going to that ball game. He said, I might as well say it because the Lord already knows it. You know? And that's just the type the preacher was. You know, he just, you're right. He, he just, he, he would say, because he said, the Lord already knows it. If he, he, he said, if he can read your mind, he's going to tell you, tell you what it is. And, you know, he's been a blessing to this area for a long time. Still does a lot of funerals for elderly people. You know, he hasn't been in the pulpit for years. And I think, gosh, he's got to be close to 90 years old. And, you know, and, and Reverend Paul didn't start out in the ministry. Matter of fact, Reverend Paul was, you know, he was just a regular old person that years ago was, had a drinking problem. 
But the Lord touched his life and made him a minister and, and a good minister. Somebody that you can say that truly had a calling on his life and just wasn't a minister. He, he truly loved the Lord. And, and his, his, his heart's call was everybody else would come to salvation knowledge of that. Should we not be that way too? I just tell you in these end times that, that I think the Lord's looking through his church world right now. And he's looking for those hearts that are, they've been, refi- they've been, they've been through the fire. And they've been refined. They're ready for the water to be poured through them. They're ready to lead people to salvation. They're not afraid to speak up in a crowd when somebody needs to be corrected, maybe. Or speak to somebody that's possibly on their deathbed about Christ. They're not afraid to do it. They're not afraid to be uh, shut down or say, hey, you know, you're just a holy roller. Or... But they're a willing vessel to encourage people that in these times that are hard and, and money's tight and everything. That I, I think he's looking through his church world, who, who's, going to, who's going to be used? Who's going to be available in these end times? And Lord, I say, you know what? 53 years you let Jeff do what he's wanted to do. And now I'm ready. I'm ready. If it takes whatever I got, <laughs> he's working on that. <laughs> <laughs> then so be it. But you know, make it simple enough though that an old horse trainer can recognize that this is your, your your hand. This is your guiding. Amen? Amen. I mean, he's let, us, he's let all of us enjoy good lives. But he's positioned us for this time. And, you know, that's why I asked Dell this morning. I said, how old are you, Dell? He said, because back there he told me he's 82. I thought, man, this guy's got a motor that runs pretty good for 82. <laughs> but you know what? Moses was, what, 80 when he came up out of the wilderness. How old was Abraham? I mean, he was so old that... You know, they had a kid when, when it was years past their prime. But that's when the Lord used them. And I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not discounting the young people, but I think us older people that he's prepared us for this time. That through the, the disappointments of life and through the struggles of life, that he's built faith up in us, knowing that if somebody comes to the altar for a healing, that we believe that's going to happen. That he's endured a faith in us. You know, and I'll be honest with you, there's, I've went through a time, a period of time of prayer. And I'll be honest with you, it seems like I hardly get off my knees. And I see the opposite happen. And I'm thinking, man, Lord, what's going on? And I'm not talking just maybe one prayer or two prayers. I'm talking about weeks of prayer saying, what's going on, Lord? Or the Lord not really being on my time schedule when it comes to money or, or situations. But you know what? That's how the Lord builds our faith in us. Amen? Yes. You know, my biggest thing is, is when we float out of here or buzz out of here, or if he lays me in, in, the, in the grave, that when I go to glory, I wanna, I'm just like you guys. I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. Everybody with me on that one? Amen. So I, as I get ready, to close here, just, you know, you can look to your right, you can look to your left. You know, that's what Matthew 5 talks about the ten virgins. Five are wise, five are foolish. Now you've got to remember, he's talking about the church. And it's in a day not to grow tired. It's a day to go back to the river and ask for a refreshing, a re, re uh, of his Holy Spirit to encourage you to once again let the word come alive to you let, let prayer and, and fellowship with the Lord and with other people come alive again because this is the time when it's real no more talking the night is almost over and the day is here and we have to be prepared amen, amen. why don't you stand your feet and we're going to close the word of prayer. All right, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that tonight, Lord, that once again you give us the opportunity, Lord, just to sit down and talk about you and brag about you and know the things that you've instilled in our hearts, Lord, that 
those things are true and they're coming to life. And, and Lord, that we just ask that for each and every one of us that's here tonight, that Lord, that you just refresh us, Lord, with your presence. That Lord, that we know you in a way that we've never known before, known you before. And, and Lord, that we make ourselves available to be used of you. Never to be ashamed of you, Lord, but to speak of, of your salvation in and out of season. And, and Lord, to, meet, to, to bring many to your cross. And uh, so, Lord, just touch whatever infirmities we have. Lord, help us with our shortcoming and our, and our walk with you. And, Lord, let us be an encouragement to this outside world. Because, Lord, you know there's so many that have walked away from you and so many, Lord, that don't know you. And, Lord, I know your love, Lord, is for each and every one of them. We know, Lord, that you went to the cross for them. So, Lord, let us be that your outstretched hand, Lord to help bring them back to your cross and salvation. Lord, be with your people this week. Lord, be an encouragement unto them. Let them sense your presence in everything that they do. And Lord, let them wear the smile that you have entrusted them with because they know, Lord, that the Spirit of Christ is in them. We give you all glory and honor and praise in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.